Snout it. Hi guys, uh, thank you so much for coming to our fourth FEMEX talk of this year. Um, this will be the first talk we're having under our new name, which is Bristol University Intersectional Feminist Society. Anytime. They shouldn't think it, no they shouldn't say it in gifts, in they shouldn't concerts. like even consider just thinking about the letter N next to the letter G, like it just should not happen. No, no, no. I'm blacker than you because I like, insert stereotypically, black thing here. <sighs> I'm not very stereotypically black, so I get this a lot. Or I dance better than you, or I listen to more yeah, hip hop. Yeah, I can twerk. Or I'm like that, <laughs> that person's more authentic or whatever. Or they like chicken uh, more, like dumb, dumb stuff. People are like, oh, I love Stormzy. <laughs> Literally. And I'm like, I'm really happy for you. Cool. There are black people that listen to like Chopin and like, I don't know, like Mac DeMarco. Like, the black people are not monolithic. We can be anything that we want to be. And you yeah. saying like, oh, I listen to Stormzy or I've seen like New Jack City makes me blacker than you. It's, it's nonsense. Like, it's not, it's not okay. I eat jerk chicken. <laughs> yeah, that's a Therefore, good one. I'm, uh, that's a deep I'm one. blacker than you. Mm. Um, or watermelon. I eat watermelon. The grape soda I get as well. All the time. Like, people would be like, do you listen to grime? Do you listen to yeah, Kaden? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything yeah, like this. Yeah. And then they'd be like, oh, I'm blacker than you. <laughs> like, all the time. All the time that was yeah. like it. Or like, people would be like, oh my god, but I know the whole Kendrick rap when you don't. I'm blacker than you. <laughs> How come you say the N word and I can't? Why do you want to say it so badly? Yeah. That's the real issue there. Why do you want to say it so badly? <laughs> you know, um, is it like, do they feel like they're, they're being excluded from something, you know? That's like, that's one, their once, first, once. yeah, their first case <laughs> of exclusion, that they can't be part of this group. And they always go like, uh, but, but rappers say it, and like, you can say it. You know, rappers use it in music, but that's them, not me, and you know, I'm not rich enough to be shouting that. Why would you? Why is that a word that you want why, in your vocabulary? Why do you, you need want, it in why your do vocabulary? You need that to say it? <laughs> why, first of all, why do you want to say it? Because you know the connotations. And second of all, mind your business. I don't understand. No, exactly. I don't use the M word, but like. I think it's much the same thing. If other black people choose to use it, it's more of a reclaiming it, like the history yeah. and such behind yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's very much the they same thing the as like into... words that were used against like the queer community that they now use all the like time, and stuff. like yeah, exactly. all of that kind of stuff. That's their word to use because it's the word that was used to oppress them. History, if yours. they want to take it mm. and use it for themselves, fine. I don't see colour. Are, are you blind? Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, please then explain. Um, the fact that black men get stopped um, several times more than white men. You know, society sees colour. So you should see colour, you should address it, and you should make sure that... <laughs> if you're saying you don't see colour, then you're not seeing the oppression all black people face or yeah. other BME communities. And you're not seeing your privilege. <laughs> and you're not seeing like yeah. the beauty of our different cultures. People say I don't see colour. It's like they expect me to be thankful mm. that they're not judging me based on the colour of my skin. I, I, um, I remember uh, Tommy Lauren went on uh, The Daily Show yeah. and she said it to Trevor Noah and Trevor Noah was like, oh what, so when you see a red traffic light, do you like, not do anything? <laughs> it was hilarious. Right, and the problem is, the people who say I don't see colour, usually on average, tend to be 
the kind of people who think they're really like free liberals and, liberal, and really yeah, like, like open. I don't see colour in that. I'm like not like racist, but like, <coughs> yeah, it's like a way of I mean? like almost like getting away from the issue. Because, yeah, like, yeah. Most, it's like, oh, there's a problem like the racism is an issue, but I don't see colour, so, so it doesn't don't talk to me about me. it. Exactly. Yeah, like, I'm yeah, not, that's it's literally issue. like it's literally them saying like I'm not one of the bad ones. Like, I'm actually responsibility. I'm on your side, but at the same time, I'm run. just trying to be friends with everyone, and you're like, no. So yeah, um, this kind of, I kind of want to talk about a bit more about this whole idea that women, especially black women, kind of have this almost sort of, like, like this intercept of, of, of oppression because they're black and because they're women. And that's kind of summed up in, in the Sojourn War, like this whole idea of you're being like, hated not just because you're a woman, not because you're black, but because you're a black woman. And we kind of see that reflected in the way that we kind of treat uh, mainstream black women. Obviously, I know the events of man problematic, but we'll get into that later. Um, but just the fact that if you look at people like R. Kelly, Chris Brown, Kanye West, like still out there, still making music, like Kanye West literally met with Trump at Trump Tower. Like, as you know, that's jokingly said, oh, I want to perform that for the inauguration because Trump is so annoying. But like, Kanye West actually met Trump. Like, it's insane. Um, how, how much there's a disparity between the way that black women and black men are treated. And I have um, Dianago up there because, you know, Dianago is somebody who has, like, if you know anything about, like, the Labour Party or just, like, you watch the news, you'll know that she has been a serious um, support for Jeremy Corbyn, like, from the get-go, she has been backing him, like, from day. Um, and a lot of other people have flaked on him and they have not got nearly as much hate as Diane Abbott has got. Like, some of the death threats, the rape threats that she gets on Twitter, like, daily, like, it is just, it is, it is really uncomfortable to know that every, any time a black woman puts themselves, you know, forward in the firing line, they're literally, they, they get, they get shredded for it. Um, and one thing that really upsets me is that people get really angry at Diane Abbott because, you know, She's supposed to be late MP and she sent her son to a private school. And if you know, and like obviously, I'm very divided on this, but I know that if, if you're looking at the current statistics on education, it's the black Caribbean boys who do the worst. Even when everyone is like this, they're still like this. And I feel like as a black woman, you are trying to ensure that your children have the, have the best future. And if you know that you're going into a state, state school, jeopardizes that, then you have to do what you have to do. But and other people have as well, I think Shami Chakrabarty sent her son to a private to a private school as well. Like why is it that Diana is the one that gets so much slack for it? Um, and even if you look at um, Kanye West and Zinia Vance and the extent to which you know both of them have been quite problematic. But even like, so Azealia Banks used to be very vocal about like issues to black women and stuff like that. And then she was like, oh, I support Trump. And everyone was a bit like, oh, like, let's delete her. But Kanye West, more than Kanye West, he was like, oh, George Bush doesn't care about black people at the fundraiser on TV. And then he's, you know, at Trump Tower meeting Trump. And it's just how I did it. Like, we kind of rationalize Kanye West's behavior and we kind of say, oh, you know, it's okay. He's just a creative individual who does really cool things. Like, it's part of his creative process. But Azealia Banks, oh, she's a crazy black bitch. Like, some of the things people say about Azealia Banks on Twitter, like, it makes me really uncomfortable. Like, I know she's black, but she's not sick, and she's just not okay. But, like, the way that we kind of use mental health as a stick to beat her with, whereas people like Kanye West and Kid Cudi, who have also had issues with mental health, are treated a lot nicer than she is, um, really frustrates me. Um, but yeah, so just a bit about Zinia Banks. Obviously, I know Zinia Banks is very, very problematic. Um, she has said some really ridiculous things, and like, I don't condone anything she says, but I do not like sometimes the way that she is critiqued. Like, people like Katie Hopkins, who tweet, who she tweeted, like, I, would, um, I wouldn't send votes for immigrants, I'd send bombs. Like, why is she still on Twitter? Like, why is Donald Trump still on Twitter? Like, sometimes I feel like, and also the things that these people have in common is they're all white, like, and it just really frustrates me sometimes because there's just no, there's no sort of like equal, like, we're obviously we're not treated equally. And I feel like, you can hate Azealia Banks, like, that's fine. But if you hate Azealia Banks more than you hate anyone that's done the same thing as her, like, that's, that's internalized racism. Um, and one of the things, so obviously, like, I just love this quote here in her interview where she's like, Whenever I have anything to say about anything, it's like, oh, here goes that crazy black bitch again. Like, and I know I identify with so much, I get it all the time. Anytime I open my mouth to be like, mm, that's problematic, it's just, just 
just as may occur today. Um, so I wrote a piece for like a long time ago about like black women and mental health and my experience of mental health at university. So around in first year, I was living in the Colston Street. So right at the end of October, there was obviously the massive fire in my accommodation, and I literally had like no staff for like four weeks, and I had to move to like Stoke Bishop, which was like horrific. <laughs> I have just never wow, like I just wow. I experienced new lows living in that place. Especially because I decided to live in the city city centre for a reason because I wanted to be like around like other people, close to stores and like I just knew all the black people lived in the city centre. Whereas like five black people lived in Stoke Bishop last year and it was just like horrific. Um, and so that was a really stressful time for me and it was at that point that I started to realise that actually maybe um, like maybe I maybe the way I'm feeling isn't like like solely, oh, I'm, I'm just hit, like here, I'm just low, like maybe there's a lot more to it. And it was when I started to realise that I should probably check out mental health. And it's something that I had battled with before university, but it's one of those things where when you're from a BME background, uh, mental health isn't, it's not really spoken about as much. There's a lot of stigma attached to it, but they're also really detrimental because it says to me, I, oh, I'm not black girl magic or I'm not black girl excellence unless I'm like Serena Williams, but I can't do any sport at all, do you know what I mean? It's, it just puts these really high standards on, on what it means to achieve as black women and a lot of us are constantly trying to despise that because we have to be magic when actually like, we're just human, like just like anyone else, but we're just not afforded that. Um, and also kind of one of the things is that you know black British girls are the most likely to self-harm but the least likely to receive any help for it. And this, this whole idea of like black women are like we're we are we are mothering everyone, we're always there for everyone, taking on everyone's burdens, taking on everyone's issues that we probably are suffering ourselves but don't really know who we can turn to. Um, so it's a, it's a huge issue. But yeah, basically to me, and this is just me being really tired of like all of this stuff, like just absolutely exhausted. You know, that's, it's uh, Dominique and Cayola, but I'm very tired. Um, but yeah, moving on swiftly. <laughs> um, the politics of desire in uni boys and what it is like as a black woman being in these spaces. So this is really interesting. This, um, thing here, she's like the of black people. Basically, this is what, this guy I really liked in first year, this is what he told his brother about me. And his brother, I was like, hi, I'm Chateau. He was like, mm, I know you, my brother said that you're like the Tommy Loren for black people. And I was like, I really don't know how I feel about that, but okay. Um, and it was just one of those things where it's like, if you're like an outspoken like black woman in these like predominantly white spaces and you're very like, very much um, vocal, about issues and you raise awareness and you bring attention to issues that like people just kind of like don't really like that because everybody wants to kind of exist in this bubble everyone's trying to assimilate to fit into middle class white Bristol culture and then there's me being like racism and they're just like I'm not black dude <laughs> and it's just like that so you obviously get people who call you things like that which is really stressful but you know we keep going and so I, I guess kind of wrapped up in being a black woman at Bristol who is like, I don't know, like dating or whatever, is things like colorism, hypersexualization, and fetishization. Um, so kind of any like any black girls like use Tinder in Bristol or has has matched a white person in Bristol like knows. So last year the one of the people in the BME committee sent us a screenshot of like her Tinder because I was like, oh are you African? African and it's like, just so you know, like, and it's so stressful because like you just want to meet someone nice and then I'll match with someone and they're like, oh, you're such a like Nubian princess diamond queen from the river now and, and, and oh, you are carrying the burden of a thousand years and it's like, oh, can you just, like, why, like, you want to say it to a white girl, like, and then there's this one here, it's like, when, this is, um, so, uh, a girl called Charlie, she's in, one of the editors for Garden, she did a, wrote, she, like, basically wrote a piece on what it was like, kind of, date, like, dating online, um, as a big and then this is one of the messages she got, like, he was like, hello, black beauty, and then he's like, how about caramel beauty, it's like, you wouldn't, like, would you say to a white person, hello, like, my mayonnaise, <laughs> 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 Of like black women, which is so stressful, and it makes it really difficult because like I'm 
don't want to meet a nice white guy and date him, but I also don't want him to call me like chocolate Sunday, or I don't want him to like <laughs> fetishize me. And it's like it makes it really difficult as a woman of colour if you're especially if you're dating like white people because you're like, I don't know if you like me because I'm a human being, or I don't know, or do you like me because like my skin looks like I don't know, like some sort of nice treat. Like and it's just really hard because I don't want to be treated like that because sometimes you feel like, oh like I'm gonna have to just settle for like whatever because Either way, like this, like where, where do I live in all this? And obviously, I know like not all white people are like this, but like I do get this a lot. And like, I don't even use Tinder anymore, but like when I did use it, like I just got it all the time. And it was just like I'm out straight away. And like it was only until I told people like the things that people had said to me that people were like, that is really problematic. Because I was so used to it, I was like, oh, like here we go again. This is so stressful. And then obviously tied into this is this whole idea of like. Um, being like lighter skin or dark skin and obviously this is something that exists in both black and brown communities um, where people are told like you know you're you're pretty for a black girl or you're pretty for a dark skin girl it's like why can't they just be pretty full stop do you know what I mean um, and it's really problematic because when you try to have these conversations with people people like know about like white women especially black men like they will know about racism they'll know about stop and search but you're like come as and all of a sudden they they can't hear or they can't see and they're like oh, I don't know like it's like it's really weird and like when you're having these conversations people don't don't like to admit it like because I mean I don't want to go too much into the whole preferences thing because I know this does get a lot of people like wild up but like you 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 do know that like it's about your proximity to whiteness, like how attractive you are, and your proximity to whiteness is, is also uh, denoted by the colour of your skin and this whole idea of like just just being real. Like if 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 you don't like someone because they're dark skin, you need to understand that a lot of it is your internalised anti-blackness, and a lot of it is you being like, why don't I like people who are the same skin colour as me? Why do I demand to be with someone who's black than me? Why do I only want to have mixed race babies? Like, that's not a really weird thing. Like, Specializing mixed race children, like they're just children. Like stop that, it's weird. Like people just don't understand it. But it comes into it a lot as a black woman because sometimes you feel like, okay, cool. Like this person doesn't like me, but if I was like this color with this hair, and this color eyes, would they like me then? Like it, it, how much has it got to do with me as a black woman? How much has it got to do with their internalized anti-blackness? Um, and then yeah, basically. I remember the other day. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Oh, okay, basically, I'm gonna try it out. Um, so like just a few kind of things like why is it also revolutionary if I see like a black couple with Bristol? Like why is it like oh my days? Like why is like hashtag Black Love like on like Twitter on the internet on Instagram like a thing like um, and then when when I speak up like why am I the champion of for black people? Do you know what I mean? Like, these are all very much real issues. Um, I'm just, I, I lost the post now, but um, the other day, like our friend Simran, so she writes for Gowan as well, she put up a Facebook post because uh, Deb Patel is like now dating some white girl called like Phoebe or something. Um, and she was like, oh, come on, Deb Patel, like, you have like one job, like, like really? Um, and everyone was getting like really angry at her, being like, oh, why are you saying that? You can only date white women, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we live in a world that um, values or, or says that um, if you're white or if the closer you are to white, you're more beautiful. And so as a brown woman, like, I don't feel like I'm as valued as much as, as brown men as a, as a white woman would be. And it's the same with black men. Like, they will treat a white woman a lot nicer than the way they treat me. Um, and you're allowed to be upset by that, and you're allowed to want to have you know positive role models of black love um, in the media, and you know, that doesn't mean that you don't that you don't believe in interracial couples. Like no one's saying that, but they're just saying that as a black woman, I have been trod on, I have been insulted. A lot of the comments about my skin color and about me as a person they don't come from white people; they come from black men. Black men are the reason why I would feel insecure, and as a result, if I'm like, oh, it would be really nice to see a black man with a black woman to kind of make me feel, even though I shouldn't, but make me feel a little bit validated, make me feel like, oh, I am beautiful, or that there is hope for me. Because it's like, what do I do? I'm either with a black man who really doesn't want to be with me because I'm not light enough, or I'm with a white man that calls me Nubian Princess Diamond. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like you're just kind of stuck in this like middle, horrible middle ground where you're just like, like, what do I, where do I go, like, what do I do? And it's really, it's really frustrating. 
you know, it's, it's one of those things where you just have to keep having those conversations. And like, obviously, like a lot of my friends know, like even a lot of the first years know, like, I'm really on it about all this stuff because I really want them to be able to understand and translate this stuff. People, there's no point in me just like grovelling or writing like long Facebook statuses. Like, I need to actually be engaging people in discussions about this. Otherwise, like, nothing's ever going to happen, and I'm going to continue to feel like that. Um, and so many black women growing up, young black girls, like oh, I just remember growing up in school feeling like oh, I'm not pretty because I don't look like this. And the only, black, the only people trying to bring me down make me feel insecure about who I am and the colour of my skin and the way my hair is was, you know, black men. And it's just, it's, it's like, I mean, I'm slowly unlearning that now, but I'm not, there's, by all means, I'm not perfect. By all means, I don't have it all together. And I'm not like, mm, I'm so confident, sassy. Like, I still have my own insecurities and I have my own things to work through. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a process. What's next? Oh, yeah. And so, um, Last year, um, they had like a BME meeting, and I went, and I didn't go to the meeting, but I met with them afterwards, and I was like, so like, what did you do this meeting? They were like, we were just speaking about like the fact that like, why are we all single? And I was like, oh, like, it's, a, it's, a, it's an annoying one, because obviously, this whole idea of it being tied up in internalised anti-black and brownness, um, you not liking your own, and being like, being white as being desirable and you as being undesirable. But it's also going to do the fact that like a lot of these kind of women of colour that I speak with are incredibly vocal about these issues and sometimes a lot of people just aren't, they're not down for it. They, it makes them feel uncomfortable or they don't want to have this conversation or they see it as intimidating. And at the same time, you may meet someone that you like and that likes you, but then they open their mouth and then they, they're transferred and you're like, oh, this has got to end, you know what I mean? Um, it's so, it's really frustrating, so it's, it's kind of difficult. Like, it's, it's not just like being being black, like being woman, but then being a black woman who is socially conscious and seeks to invoke change wherever she goes. Like it just makes the dating pool for you like a raindrop. You know, <laughs> it's just so stressful. Uh, but I am only done. But to wrap it up, like I really feel like we just need to have a long ass conversation about this entire article because the whole of the world got me fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, okay, like so many of the comments I got back were like, I can't believe you sent my avocado, that's so rude, like I can't believe. First of all, like why people didn't invent avocados, like, and I feel like for a lot of people this is really shocking. I think I mean, every single weekend, every single Sunday I went to my grandma's house and we have Sunday dinner and we always felt like avocado, like it wasn't just, it was, it was a play, it wasn't satire to be like, oh, why people have avocado in the gym, laughing at my salad, like, ah, it wasn't that kind of thing. Um, and like also like like no one is entitled to my culture like like no one is entitled of course you can you can wear it you can do it but don't feel like you own it and don't feel like you can tell me how I kind of can't feel about um, you wearing that um, challenging the racism in your own families and your friendship groups this is one thing I spoke about a lot because I feel like a lot of the time we're in these spaces and we're kind of like yeah we all agree this is great and then you go home and then your grandma's racist at Christmas and then you're like on Twitter oh my grandma was so racist. But what did you do? Do you know what I mean? Like, and everyone's like, oh, well, she's gonna die soon. But you can't say that. Like, you can't say that. Like, you literally, you have to start somewhere. You have to have the confidence to address these issues, even in you know your own personal space. That's something I do a lot. Like, a lot of my family like are still like really homophobic. And over Christmas, yes, it gets stressful. But I'm constantly drilling it into them to be like, you know, a lot of the things that you're saying are problematic. Can you like understand this? And it gets a bit long, and you know, whatever. But you have to challenge it there because otherwise, obviously, in these student bubbles, we're all going to stay woke, but then outside, no one is. So what's the point? Um, I'll say that bit. Black men stop being begs and faking on black women. So basically, this was my first ever debut in um, <laughs> the Daily Express, uh, in one of two articles. This was a festival that happens every summer in Paris called Afropunk, right? Afropunk is literally, originally it was a celebration of like black punks and stuff. Um, but it's constantly, it's evolved since and now they take on a lot more like different like mainstream artists and stuff. And it was a really good festival and like black people from across the world come to Paris, Brooklyn and London for this festival. To kind of just embrace their culture, and it's not even like you know they're they're, they're like people. They have real jobs. They're like in the real world, but then they take a weekend off to be like, do you know what? I just want to be my entire self for one weekend and go. And it was great. I mean, with all these like black people, and then these three white women came in like dashikis and braids and like all of this stuff. And like basically, no one was really speaking to them. And then some some these really nice black women came up to them and were like. 
look like I know you're feeling a bit awkward right now, but we're going to explain how you come into a political, a very political festival like Afropunk, dressed like um, an auntie is not acceptable. <laughs> um, and uh, so then they they had a conversation and they was like fine, and then like everyone kind of left it. And also I was on the side of like mm, drama, um, but then it was fine and everyone seemed okay. And then the three black men came up to them. Um, and they were like to the black men, oh, that girl was so horrible to us. She was shouting to us that we had to take off our things and leave. And the black men got so angry at these black women who told them to like stop. Um, who didn't even tell them to stop, they just explained. They were so angry at the black women, they were being so aggressive to the black women that these black women had to leave Afro Punk Festival, Afro Punk Festival. Black women had to leave Afro Punk Festival because these white women were crying because they came dressed up. In, like, and the thing is, like, and then obviously I took a picture of it and then they made the whole story about me. But one of them was taking a picture of me and like, oh look what's happening at Afropunk. Um <laughs> but I shouldn't mind about this, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and it's just like this whole thing where like it's I don't know what it is, and we see it happen so many times, like a lot of black women have experienced this being in situations like and if you upset a white woman or if a white woman starts crying, black men will lose their shit. So many retailers some of the most like ridiculous things like clothes, jewellery that have belonged to people's cultures forever now being sold on like mm -hmm. an outfit is called Aztec and you're like you can't call everything Aztec like <laughs> or tribal print and you're like this is just really offensive. Um, so yeah like that's why it's important to kind of have those conversations and I know people always think oh you're being so pedantic you're being blah 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 but at the end of the day like they will we will see urban outfits profiting of of, of that culture and those people will never get anything back from it and it's like you're kind of living in this predominantly white predominantly middle class space and kind of the one thing that I have or the one thing that a lot of really individuals have is, is their culture and it's like that's the last thing you like what more do you want from us like as we've seen in the slide we're obviously the most economically deprived we're attaining less than anyone like all of this stuff the only thing we have is our culture why do you want that why can't we just have that that's it like everything comes in like you're doing better than us and everything the only one thing i have is my culture like i'm gonna do that better than me as well like can't like doesn't mean like, can i can't catch a break do you know what i mean like it's really frustrating um, I just love this gift so much, I just put it in there. <laughs> it's literally my face all the time. Um, um, but yeah, so obviously like it's not all like doom and gloom and I feel like even though I've been going through all this stuff, like for me what has been kind of my saving grace is, is being able to create spaces especially for black women to come together. This is like a picture of, from one of our like black girls' lunches. Um, and it's, it's just great. And that, I mean, this kind of small community is kind of like all I have at this university um, because everything else kind of, everything else seems so stacked against you that the only place I can find refuge is in other women of color who, have, who are experiencing the exact same things as me and they validate me because when I have this conversation with other people, they're like, oh, I'm going to tell you, like, you're, you're just being crazy. It's less not that. Like, no, I, but you know what I mean? But they actually understand me, and it's like nice not to be gaslit sometimes and just know that my experiences are valid and real. Um, so, yeah, obviously, I'm doing a lot of stuff with Bristol's New Black, and the university is researching into the end attainment, um, and we obviously have an active African Caribbean Association and other cultural societies, so it's not like completely over, it's not, there's not complete doom and gloom, but we are actively doing stuff, but I guess it requires kind of everybody, even if you're not BME, to kind of be an ally to that um, and support us in that, which a lot of people have, and like the way we have, I've just had a field day on my entire life, like I'm so grateful for the support I've had from both BME and non-BME individuals. Um, but then, yeah, this was just the quote I ended my Afro article on. If all the white girls wearing K rows and Bantu not specialise in black men and all the boys dressed like Buster Ram circa 1980 religiously reciting storms, he shut up, decided to actively campaign against racism as opposed to just appropriating the culture, maybe we can see some real change in society. So that's what I'm going to leave you guys with. Thank you so much.